All right, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so ready for a second day, yay. Um, so you'll see today is, is quite different. So yesterday, uh, just a quick recap. Um, I don't know if you had dreams about uh, variants and uh, you know patients and disease. Um, so the start, day started with uh, with Mike, who talked about uh, phenotypes and you know the importance of phenotyping and ontology. Um, and then we went on between you know Mathieu and myself went on over sort of all the steps of variant calling and variant annotation. Uh, I hope we gave you some se a sense of sort of the. The complexity of, of, of doing that um, and the fact that there's actually lots of steps and lots of ways you can actually improve variant calling, different choices in how you do the annotation, and so on. And after that, um, Mike came back and it sort of showed how once you get that list of variant, um, you, can, you can go back and, and try to interpret that in the context of disease. And then at the end of the day, uh, Carl sort of uh, put that in perspective on how you actually use that in, in clinical tests. So, so all of that was really focused on, on genetic variants, right? And how do you actually call variants? How do you interpret variants? So today, um, it's going to be completely different where we're going to focus on other uh, types of uh, omics data sets, so uh, epigenetic, epigenetics and expression data, uh, and how that can also be used uh, in the context of, of uh, exploring um, disease and, and so on. So um, the learning objective of, of my module to start the day is, uh, has the following objectives. So we're going to try to understand a bit why uh, epigenetic and epigenomics is important in the context of genomic medicine. Uh, I'll do a quick, uh, you know, overview of some of the profiling technologies that, that um, just so that you have to, everybody has the same uh, background, um, and then go into actually uh, trying to use uh, some of these resources, knowing what's available and trying to use them. Uh, so, the, um, you know, the lab that's just after this intro is, is all going to be just web-based, um, so, so not command line like yesterday. So, so why do we? Why is it important to talk about epigenomic uh, at this workshop? Um, so I already touched on that a little bit yesterday, but um, you know, of course, genes only account for about two percent of the genome. There's a lot more going on uh, around these genes in terms of how they actually get turned on, turned off, and so on. So, the genome is full of these regulatory elements, uh, and and understanding uh, that those components will, will really help also understanding mechanistically how some variants might be associated with the disease. Um, so I showed you this slide yesterday already. Um, so again, some of you work in cancer, but this is also true uh, for, from GWAS. Uh, if you look, the majority of, of, of mutations in the context of cancer are outside of coding genes. And the same is also true for uh, you know, GWAS that I've actually identified variants that are associated with a disease, a majority of these variants that are identified end up being outside of gene. So, you know, how do you understand and, and can we uh, do better in understanding what these, which of these variants is important and what exactly uh, it might be doing? So, so this is sort of really uh, one of the application that's that sort of follows on what you, we covered yesterday. Uh, how can we better annotate non-coding variants, so just like we were annotating the coding variants yesterday? Um, the other important area where epigenetics is, is useful in the context of uh, genomic medicine is in, in, in doing this type, and this is a you know, famous paper by uh, Chuck Peru, uh, early 2000, one of the first microarray study that showed that uh, there's actually a different subtype of breast cancer that can be defined based on expression pattern. So you can really sort of classify patient based on their expression pattern. And this has uh, proven to be very useful to actually uh, come up with, with, in some case, targeted therapies that really uh, work well in particular subgroups. Um, so this type of work is exactly what we're going to be doing in some of the other modules. Uh, by Andre and also uh, Anna, so really sort of using these epigenomic data sets to, to better understand, um, uh, well, in the context of cancer, the different subtypes, but also in the context of more uh, 
uh, I think uh, Andre's, uh, Andre's example is uh, just comparing disease to normal. So you have these two groups. Um, so that's the other broad uh, area of application of these technologies in, in genomic medicine. And again, uh, most of the other modules are going to be uh, covering that. So in terms of um, the technologies that we're using, so again, I'm not going into any of details here because, um, you know, that would take, uh, there's actually a full of these, there's one of these workshops that, that's focused exactly on, on epigenomics and epigenomic technologies and, and downstream analysis. And if you're interested in that, I encourage you to, to look that up. So that's another bioinformatics.ca uh, workshop. But so, so one of the, the key technology is, uh, is really chip sequencing. So in, in, for this technology, what you're doing is that you're actually um, enriching for DNA fragments that are actually associated with a particular protein of interest. So in this case, all DNA fragments that are uh, associated with uh, P53 binding uh, region get actually pulled down and sequenced uh, just like you would sequence a, a normal gene, a, a normal DNA. Uh, but because you're enriching for regions of the DNA that are bound by the particular protein that you're pulling down, what you'll get are, are these regions that have more reads than not. So here we're not calling variants, or that's not the main objective. The objective is really to look at these uh, regions that are enriched for DNA fragments that we can observe after we map them back on the genome, and that gives us a sense of where P53, in this case, binds. Um, so this is useful because now, again, no matter where P53 is bound in the genome, we'll find the binding sites for P53. And again, thinking about annotating non-coding variants, if you see a non-coding variant in a P53 binding site, that might give you a sense that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a more important uh, variant than others. So we can do this uh, if we, the, the antibody is, is targeting P53. We can also target um, various histone marks, and that's another way of actually uh, profiling regions that correspond to enhancer or that are repressed and so on. So chip sequencing is to profile the chromatin and get a sense of, uh, you know, where enhancers or regulatory elements might be in the genome. Uh, the other obvious one is, is RNA sequencing, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So this is just, again, uh, you know, a, a very powerful method depending on how you prepare the RNA. You can profile different uh, type of uh, RNA transcript, uh, whether they're poly-A transcripts or, or total RNA. You sequence these, uh, and again, you get a sense of which transcripts are, are expressed in, in different contexts. Um, the last uh, type of, of uh, data that I'll, I'll briefly talk about is, is uh, methylation profiling. Uh, so here, either using microarrays or again sequencing, the key uh, uh, is that um, methylate, so the DNA gets processed using a bisulfite treatment, which affects the methylated uh, Cs differently from the unmethylated Cs. And there's a way to, after the sequencing, to, you know, extract or, 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 or um, deconvolve which sites were actually uh, methylated. So again, without going into uh, much detail here, but uh, methylation sequencing or methylation array is another way of looking again uh, genome-wide at which regions are uh, are methylated. So, so again, continuing, and I, you know, I'm finishing up with my introduction. But why is all of this uh, relevant? Um, so this is uh, I'm showing, uh, I guess, one example from the NIH roadmap that this uh, that did uh, this kind of profiling. Uh, systematically across lots and lots of, of tissues. So, I mean, this is a complicated graph. Um, I guess, can you, so, so uh, if you, I'm trying to see, it's tiny. So, on this, uh, on this list here, you have various diseases, and each of these, uh, it was actually a GWAS study that was done that identified region in the genome that were associated with obesity or LDL cholesterol and so on. So each of these is actually a GWAS study that identified regions in the genome that, that are associated with these various disease. Uh, as I mentioned, most of these regions that were associated with the disease were non-coding. Uh, so, so the nice thing is that 
by doing this profiling now of all of the enhancer regions and so on in, in, in a number of cell types. So on this axis, you have various cell types um, that basically define, the you know, in that particular cell type, where are the enhancers? Um, what you see is that, uh, it, you know, in, well, it's tiny, so it's hard to see, but so all of these uh, LDL cholesterol, for instance, uh, GWAS hits were enriched almost only in, in this tissue, which is the liver, so which sort of makes sense. So if you look at enhancers in the liver, uh, that's where uh, all of these GWAS hits are, are enriched. So there's really, uh, an I guess, an encouraging correspondence between, uh, you know, uh, specific GWAS hits and regions that are actually in open chromatin in the tissue that's relevant. Um, yeah? So, so it could be also uh, due to variation. Let's say there's a C variation. Yeah. So that, that site is no longer be able for methylation. So if you see there's a methylation or not methylation, it could be due to methylation or it could be due to the single nucleotide variation. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So it could be pure. It could be no genetic effect and just a pure epigenetic effect yeah. um, that that's actually associated with the disease because of an environmental factor. Absolutely. So, but so when you analyze this data, actually you have to kind of identify which one actually is due to methylation, which one yes. is, uh, is actually due to genetic variation. Sure, but so but but in this case, we really use the GWAS, the genetic, as the basis. So we know that gen, there's a genetic factor here, right? So, but we don't know in which tissue and 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 so on. But then, if you look, you know, it, it, there's a very good correspondence usually between, you know, the disease and the 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 regions that are open, you know, the accessible or the enhancer regions of the right tissue, as opposed to in any other tissue. So that's you know, I guess, a, a positive uh, result. Um, so just to, to drive on that point a little bit more, uh, this is one of the, uh, I think, a very nice example of, of how, again, you can use epigenomic to, to better understand, uh, you know, why a particular region, a particular variant might be associated with the disease. Because, again, the, what the GWAS give you is that there's a variant in that region that's associated with the disease, but you have nothing in between, right? So you don't know at all mechanistically why that variant might be associated with the disease. So FTO uh, is a gene, so there were a number of GWAS done on weight and obesity, and they identified within that gene that there was a haplotype that really was associated with the disease. If you have that variant, you tend to be like I think uh, a kilogram uh, heavier than if you if you're an heterozygote you're you're, you're going to be, you know, on in general people were one kilogram heavier than if you didn't have. So that particular variant was found in this uh, gene called the FTO gene, which is uh, fat and obesity associated gene. I think right. So there's clearly in that region a genetic variant that associates with the disease. And, and a lot of work was done on that gene itself and to try to understand how that gene uh, might be associated with, uh, might lead to that increased risk of, of obesity. But by looking at epigenomic data uh, in that paper, what they observe is that, so if you look at the bottom here, uh, if you look in, so you've got two genotypes in that region. You have the normal genotype and you have the risk genotype. And you see that various genes Actually, you know, there's no difference in expression of FTO uh, between the two genotypes. What you do see, though, is that there's a big difference in, in genes that are nearby, IRX3 and IRX5. So it turns out that, that that genetic variant might be affecting the gene in which it's embedded, but it's actually affecting even more so some genes that are actually further down. So. Again, there was a lot of work that, that was actually being applied to understanding how FTO might be, uh, you know, modulated in, in, the, in, in weight gain. And, but now there's, there's more work that's also looking at some of these other genes that clearly look to be affected by the variant. So that's, I mean, if you're, if you're interested in this, I definitely recommend this paper for more details on how 
you know, epigenetics helps you mechanistically better understand the impact of these genetic variants that are non-coding. Uh, okay, so that was um, sort of my intro and background as to why uh, this is relevant. So what are the, the resources now uh, that are available to, to, to uh, look at the epigenetics data? <clears throat> so I already talked about the roadmap. So one challenge in, in, in uh, I guess, using epigenetic is that um, you know, you only have one genome, but every cell type will have its own set of enhancers, its own set of, of genes that are expressed. So just like, you know, we needed a human reference genome uh, for, uh, for the variant analysis and variant calling that, that we talked about yesterday, we need a, a human epigenome reference to know what's the normal state of all of these tissues. Uh, to then be able to interpret what's, uh, what's um, you know, differences from that uh, basal state. Uh, so this work uh, really started with the ENCODE consortium that, that, you know, took on this task of trying to profile systematically what is the default um, state of the various cell type. This continued in the NIH roadmap that I talked about. Uh, and, and now there's a, there's a sort of an international consortium called uh, IAC that continues on this work. So IAC, which involves a number of countries, including these two U.S. consortiums, continue this effort of trying to map what is the normal state, uh, epigenetic state of, of uh, many different tissues. One challenge with, uh, with these experiments is that in contrast to, to just regular DNA, you need to have access to these tissues. So, you know, profiling the normal brain is not, uh, not, a, not easy in humans and so on. So, uh, part of the challenges in, in this consortium is really having access to, uh, you know, quality tissues, normal tissues, to be able to do this profiling. So the objective of the consortium is to, to gather uh, a thousand of these reference epigenome. And, and by reference epigenome, um, what, uh, what is catalog is, uh, so I mentioned that you can do chip seek on transcription factor, but you can also do chip seek on various um, histone marks, which is, uh, you know, a very good way of getting a sense of where the regulatory elements in the genomes are in a given cell type. So you can profile uh, these two. So as part of the reference epigenome uh, consortium, there's systematic profiling of these two histone marks that correspond to regions that are uh, transcribed, that allow you to determine regions that are transcribed. These two histone marks are associated with enhancer uh, regions, while these two are associated with repressed regions in the genome. And then on top of that, there's already seq data and whole genome bisulfite sequencing data. So that together really gives a good, good sense of um, the, the state, the epigenetic state of a given cell type. Um, so this is, well, maybe I, I, I well, so quickly, so, so we're part of, of IEC in terms of actually the data integration and sharing. Uh, one thing that I, I didn't talk about, but um, epigenetic data, just like uh, whole genome sequencing data, is uh, identifiable, so you can extract variants from these data sets and, and potentially re-identify the people that contributed to these samples. So the raw data uh, have to be submitted to these uh, secure archives that uh, are, are put in place to uh, protect this type of privacy, so you need to request access to the raw data. Um, but the raw data gets processed into uh, process data, which uh, is not identifiable and then can be more uh, openly shared. So the data that we'll work with is, is uh, today is really part of that process data that's not identifiable. Um, so the, the portal that, uh, that was set up for this uh, really sort of aggregates data from all of these different consortium. Uh, so it's got over 10,000 of these epigenomic data sets. Uh, it's got data sets on a number of other uh, species as well. Uh, so that's, that's the main uh, portal that we'll explore. And again, this is meant to be a resource such that um, when, you know, if you have a gene of interest and, and a tissue of interest, you, you're able to then go in and actually look to see uh, what's happening, uh, you know, at the chromatin and at the level of expression around that, uh, that region. So that's, that's really what we're going to be doing. Uh, 
uh, ENCO uh, has now just started its uh, its third phase, I believe, and they've also uh, now have a, an updated portal that's got uh, you know some some additional features. So we'll explore that as well a little bit. Uh, and finally, uh, another project that actually collects uh, quite a number of, of epigenetic data set that we're also going to look at a little bit is called the GTEx project. Uh, this one is interesting because it really links. Uh, so, so while these efforts here were focused on trying to get uh, as deep understanding of, of as many cell types as possible, um, here uh, the goal is really to link genetic uh, variation with uh, in particular expression. So, you know, a bit like in the example that I showed you on uh, the FTO gene, finding, you know, associations between non-coding genetic variants and changes in expression. So here uh, they, they take um, individuals that are actually cadavers because they profile um, many, many tissues in the same individual for which they have the genotype. And they do this systematically where uh, they do this in, in hundreds of individuals. So they are able to then sort of associate genetic variants with expression. So if you have this uh, genetic variant, um, you know, you tend to express, in this tissue, you tend to express uh, this gene highly. So again, we'll, we'll uh, explore and play with that a bit. But here, the, 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 the key here is really linking genetics with epigenetics to, to find these expression QTL. So variants associated with changes in expression. So this is, um, again, a, a portal that will play with a little bit in the, in the practical. Um, so, uh, you know, one that we won't be uh, exploring too much, but that also contains a very large number of, of epigenetic uh, array and sequence-based data sets is, is GEO. Um, so we won't be uh, exploring that, but obviously there's a lot of uh, interesting and useful data there as well. Okay, so in terms of, um, before we move on to the, the actual uh, practical, so just, I guess, a few more uh, slides on the feature of the, uh, of the, of the different portals that we're going to be playing with. Uh, so the IAC data portal that I, I mentioned, um, this, this slide is, is not the, the latest version, so there's a, few, a bit less data that we will be looking at. But you see that it aggregates data that's coming from different consortiums, uh, that you can navigate these data sets then by the tissue that they come from. So again, if you have a specific tissue that you're interested in, uh, where you think um, you know, you're, that, that maybe a variant is, uh, is important, so you can navigate them by tissues, and then you have a whole uh, collection of uh, different assays, uh, and you can also navigate based on the assay. So we'll be able to to, to really sort of explore. As a, so here, um, you know, for, for the different tissues here, based on what you've selected, you'll have the various assays that have been done. And, and in, in this grid, um, the numbers in, in, in each box is actually the number of replicates, because a bit like GTEx, uh, typically it's not done in, in a single individual, but it's done in a number of different samples. So the number within the, the grid actually corresponds to the number of, of data sets that's available of that type in that uh, tissue. So from there, you can actually visualize the data in the, in the genome browser. Um, so this is an example um, <clears throat> of, with the track. So again, that's, that's what we're going to be looking at. But um, these are, are uh, ChIP-seq marks, if I can read properly, where Again, you see that overall there's not a lot of, so what this represents is the number of reads in a given region. So what you see is that it's mostly flat, but then you have an enrichment of reads uh, that in this case would correspond to um, a particular histone mark at the five prime of that gene. Again, probably indicating that that gene is, uh, is expressed in that uh, cell line. Um, in the practical, we're going to be using the, the UCSC genome browser, but there's other uh, very nice uh, browser for epigenomic data. Uh, the WashU epigenome browser is one of them that's really sort of builds on UCSC, but adds a lot of component to, uh, to, to uh, look at uh, epigenomic data. Again, this is not um, 
something that we'll look at uh, too much. Um, back to the to the IAC data portal for a second, so you can actually. Uh, so I mentioned that the raw data is is um, you need to request access to the raw data because of identifiability concerns. Uh, the process data though is is available, so you can directly download the data and and, and load it uh, yourself or or do additional analysis if you if you like. Um, the other portal that we're going to be looking at uh, looking at is the Enco uh, data grid. Uh, so you'll see that it has. I guess a similar uh, way of navigating through all of these data sets. Uh, most of the ENCO data is uh, is actually even the raw data is is directly accessible and it's not uh, so the the patients have consented to make that data available so you can or if it's cell line I guess that's um, uh, that data is also available directly both the process and the raw data. Um, uh, so GTEx, again, so this is another portal that we're going to play with a little bit in the practical. So uh, before before moving to the practical, so one thing to, to note uh, is that, um, you know, all of this is, all of these resources are great, but um, some of the quality control that we were doing yesterday uh, is also good to, to do in some cases. Um, you know, you... you just like you shouldn't be trusting anything you read on the web, at some level you shouldn't be trusting every data set that you find on the web. Uh, so if there are ways to to, uh, to to check the quality of the data, that's that's typically a, a good thing. Uh, so again, so in some cases, uh, depending on how you're using it, uh, retrieving the raw data itself, uh, potentially validating it. So we definitely won't uh, be doing that uh, here, but. Um, but there are uh, ways to, to actually um, also, for instance, looking at correlation. If you have replicates, how good is the correlation between replicates and so on? So we'll do a bit of that um, in, in the practical to, to uh, make sure and assess that the quality is good. Because, so for instance, in the context of the IAC data portal, there are tools to do this type of correlation between data sets automatically. Uh, to, to make sure that you basically get the types of profile that, um, that you would expect. So we'll look at that. Um, if you do this type of correlation with, with different, it's all very small and tiny, uh, but if you do it with, with different marks, for instance, obviously you get uh, the groupings that you would expect, but it is a way to, to check that the, at some level the data is, is, uh, is good. Um, so again, so this will be part of the practical. So my last uh, last slide uh, is just to uh, sort of, I guess, uh, talk a bit about uh, another portal as part of IEC, which is called Deep Blue, and and the advantage of that portal is it allows you to do actually uh, interactively do uh, and various analysis using these data sets. So maybe something else uh, to explore if you're interested um, later on. But uh, but that's it for, for my introduction. So happy to take a few questions, or we can jump straight into the lab. Yeah. I was wondering how, um, how epigenomic data can be used to identify a patient, because it doesn't it depend a lot on like, what they ate, what time of day, like, right. like, unlike genetic data. So how can it be used to identify what a patient corresponds to? Or, or like just the identity of a patient, because you mentioned that they oh. You have to de identify the epigenomic yes. data. So it's because of the variance, right? So because all of this is sequence data. So if you have enough to, so, you know, you don't just get the profile. So what we produce is the profile. And from that profile, you can't really tell who that individual is. But if you look in the individual reads, you can actually extract what variance. And then, then that's a footprint of that individual. So that's why the raw data is, is sort of masked. Uh, and then the, Process data is available. Yeah, I'm just curious. For the at this moment, we don't have the whole like a normal reference by the genetic map, right? So how do we how do I do similar research like my epilepsy? Yes. Case, how do I what, what what kind of reference should I use? Well, so the question is, what tissue do you want to profile and compare as well? Well, in the context of epilepsy, you probably want to have access to brain tissues, right? So there, I mean, there are brain, both embryonic, uh, you know, from, from fetal, uh, aborted fetuses, there are some 
profiling that's been done in brain tissues, for because instance. It's going to change, right? Embryonic and adult. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, there are cases. So, so in GTEx, for instance, right? So taking. And the problem is also is that if you take after they're deceased, there's also going to be some changes that are associated with that. So it's, uh, you know, it's it's very hard, almost impossible to get exactly what you want. But but typically epigenetic landscape changes, but it doesn't change that much in terms of or not dramatically, right? So if you have very shortly after death, for instance, profiling of that tissue being done, and that's why these these resources are being set up. Then yeah, I mean you can. There are definitely so some profiling that's done in, in brain tissue. Yeah, because that would be making different reading on the brain. Yeah, that'd be different. That's right. So so that's why it's. I mean it's it's a lot of work to collect all of that, and then you need to be. So so that's why these consortiums are set up. But I mean, as part of the resources we're going to explore, are meant to be these types of references of what the normal state is, and then. If you do your own epigenetic analysis in, in a disease patients, you can really sort of compare. And that's really what you're going to be doing in, in Android Lab as well. So this here is really just to get a sense of where you can find these data sets while after you're going to be using them in, in, uh, and, and then looking at differences between group of disease patients compared to normal. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, so I think so. Encode includes quite a bit of, of high C and Chia Pet uh, data. So I know that um, this type of three. Yeah, so that's a, a good point. So one of the ways in that FTO example that they found that that region was a, so, was involved in regulating these distant genes is that they had this three D information, three D capture information. So. Uh, as part of some of these uh, databases, they also have these kinds of additional data that give you some information about which part of the genome is close in 3D to which part, uh, which helps you interpret uh, the variants as well.